Welcome to Behind the Tools. Here's Tradeify CEO and your host, Michael Steckler. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Behind the Tools from Tradeify. Um, we have a very unique guest uh, this week. I'm delighted to welcome John Taylor from K9 uh, Weed Detection. And um, just a background, John runs a business uh, where he has a dog that detects sort of uh, poisonous weeds. Um, and, and John, do you want to maybe sort of welcome to the show firstly, do you want to maybe explain to everyone what your company does? That'd be great. Uh, the, the main thing I started with Tradeify was with the weed detection. And uh, I've been doing that for seven years. Um, started with a invasive plant called Velvet Leaf that came into New Zealand in fodder beet seed. Uh, fodder beet's a uh, cattle feed and uh, highly invasive plant. Um, one plant is capable of producing 15,000 seeds per plant and the longevity of the seed is in excess of 100 years in the ground. So once you get one plant and it seeds, you've got a problem from then on. Yeah. So I did that for quite a few years with my first dog, um, Rusty, who's now retired. And then I was asked by the Department of Conservation if I could train a dog to find Spartina grass, which is an invasive estuary plant that our councils planted in the belief that it was really good to reclaim estuary land for industrial use. But the environmentalists have explained to them that that is not a thing to do to reclaim estuaries. They are a yeah. vital fish bird breeding area. So we now have that plant growing in all estuaries throughout New Zealand from Whangarei right to Bluff. And uh, the, we're in Southland, we're down to our last few plants. So the idea was a dog to find those last plants, which is um, very hard for humans. We're only good for 20 minutes of really intensive searching whereas a yeah. dog is good for five or six hours. So I've then uh, retired Rusty. Um, my new dog, Wink, is Spartina, was his first weed. He's then gone in and he's doing the velvet leaf seed plant as well. And there is another plant called Nagora burr that grows in a few farms in the North Island. We're working on that as well. So that's the basis of the of the weed detection side of it. Um, I've got other work um, coming up. I've got another plant to look at for environment Canterbury, but that's been with lockdown, that's been put on hold. Yeah. So the extent of my work now is Fong Array to Invercargill and all councils and all areas in between, like Havelock, Wellington, um, uh, Wanganui, um, Fong Array. Uh, they have plenty. We do work around um, Tauranga, uh, yeah. Napier. So I get to so travel. So you're, you're like kind that. of all over the place. Yeah, I was going to say, just for, for people that aren't, aren't in New Zealand, um, John is based in Invercargill, which is uh, right at the bottom of the South Island. Um, and so, and where you were just describing, actually, John, you, it sounds like you travel from one end of the country to the other quite regularly uh, by the sounds of it. And your, your expertise. Go on. 11,000 Ks a year. With the dog, so wow. highly travelled dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's done some miles. And did you? So, do you? And you, was your expertise in training the dogs to understand the difference between a, an ordinary plant and a and a weed? Um, the it's yeah. I don't know exactly how it works with the dog. We just um, set to and um, we we train exclusively with the one plant, probably for about. Um, about a month and a half to two months working with just that one plant and then yep. after we get that really reliable we then move that plant out into more vegetated areas and just increase it and what they actually end up doing now they're actually it's amazing to see what these dogs can actually do and what they find they find plants that we haven't got we haven't got a hope of seeing and we're talking yep. one very small stem and two three leaves maybe and that is in dense other grass vegetation, rushes and native rushes and stuff. So, and even um, we've had uh, this, we've got three dogs working now. We've had uh, my own dog and one of the other dogs has actually found plant 
underneath um, seaweed and driftwood that's been oh, wow. dumped by applied on top of it. They've actually dug and found plants underneath that weed. So it's all the might might only be two or three leaves sticking through the seaweed that's um, the, the algae type growth that we get here. So it's they, quite amazing what they find. Are they finding that is it by smell? How do they, how do they detect the difference between smell, the, the plants? Yeah, that dogs, dog, dogs are purely working by smell. That's why we've chosen the dog and, and for the reason of smell they'll find plants and thick vegetation that we can't even see. We have yeah. at times have had trouble identifying the plant ourselves that the dogs are indicating. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's amazing. It's I, was, I was very intrigued by this. I was listening to a podcast recently that was talking about dogs that were detecting uh, pancreatic cancer, I think, and, and other things like that. And again, via smell that someone actually, there's parts of the body that smell different when, they're, when they have an infection. And the dogs were able to work this yeah. out and the other, the other and taking that to these extreme they actually were having dogs that were able to spot um potentially if someone had covid um same thing don't know i don't know how obviously don't know how true these things are it was, it was a malcolm gladwell podcast for those that like to listen to these things and investigate that um called revisionist history but it was uh, interesting to to hear that because i think once you've trained trained a dog like you say they're they're quite intent on following that path and finding what that that thing is whereas our attention span isn't isn't quite as long and yeah. Um, is that the limiting factor in terms of the ability to do this more widely? It's just the number of dogs, um, or is it easy to train the dog to, to do that? Um, finding the right dog is is part of it. I've been really lucky; um, haven't had to go through a lot of dogs. Both dogs that I've actually obtained have both been really good work. They've both done really, really, really well. Um, no problem at all. They're border collies, um, New Zealand breed yeah. heading dogs. Or actually, they're eye dogs. And um, the third dog that we've just got down here is also a hunt away heading dog cross. And he's he's coming along really, really good. He's been doing some really good finds and he's only six months into the training and he's working in the field now. So. Great. That's amazing. And and it's uh, one thing that was intriguing to me was you, you, you didn't start. This isn't your original job. You've done lots of different things. How did you end up in this sort of K9 weed detection business. It seems like quite an interesting career choice. Oh, I started off started off life as a motor mechanic. I get bored very easily, then turned myself into a fitter welder. Um, had a computer business for 20 years. I got sick of building computers and stuff like that. Uh, qualified as an electrician. Um, did a bit of electrical work, went into um, fire alarm work and um, cardiac body protected testing in one of the local hospitals until I retired. Yeah. The um, first dog I had, Rusty, um, bit of a sad story. Um, he was uh, my son's dog, uh, my 17 year old son who passed away in an accident. And I was left with the dog and uh, the dog was six months old. So I thought here I've got this dog, what do I do with him? Had a background in search and rescue. So started training him as a search and rescue dog and through various reasons, um, gave up on that, um, ended up, didn't get qualified. Gave up on that after about three years, um, had, had a bit of an argument with someone and walked away from the whole thing. And I thought, well, here, I've got this dog. What am I going to do with him? And the velvet leaf incursion came along and I just had that, um, light bulb moment and uh, thought, oh, I wonder, can my dog find velvet leaf? Yeah. So I got some of the plant material and it went from there. So it just progressed and I just did it uh, just, just to see if the dog could do it. And um, we did testing with MPI. Then they decided they weren't going to use dogs to do it. And I was approached by Waikato Regional Council who asked me to bring the dog up into that area, which is a probably the worst area in New Zealand for velvet leaf, and took Rusty up to uh, Waikato, spent uh, two weeks up there, and um, yeah, had a fantastic time. They were finding four or five plants in a paddock. I was going in with Rusty and we'd find another 15. So it, it worked out, and then it just grew from there. It just got yeah. bigger and bigger, yeah. and then yeah. I got to the retirement and I used to use my annual holidays and take time away from work because this became a paid job 
I'd use my annual holidays and take time away and I'd do four or five weeks of work a year in the velvet leaf season. And then I decided to retire. Uh, retirement lasted about oh, a month and um, I just started back working again. Um, and this time I've added on to my plant detection work. I've got a contract with a local council going back to my hunting days, doing uh, possum trapping and rabbit um, control for the local council. So, right, so um, yeah, that's, well, very... that's basically a full time job. Yeah. And the so weed very... is seasonal. Yeah. Oh, the weed is seasonal. So when does the weed tend to grow? Uh, the weed tends to start um, November. We start our Spartina season, and um, that goes right through to May the following year. And the velvet leaf is usually the end of November to the end of January is the right. velvet leaf season. But the Spartina is November through to May. So yeah. It is a, a bit of a short season with it. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, very sorry to hear about your son. By the way, that's um, you know a very sad story. But um, and and with a dog, uh, sort of getting into that business and and spotting that trend was. Did you see other people doing this already elsewhere in the world, or was that just something you just you sort of decided was a, a good path to take? Well, I started it here with the plants, and then when it became evident that it was it, it worked, I started doing a wee bit of research. And the closest dogs I found to New Zealand doing plant work is in Australia on Mount Kosciuszko. Um, they have a plant there called, um, I think it's knotweed. And yeah. they use dogs for detecting that. So, But dogs are used, as, like New Zealand, we've got, um, I'm part of the Department of Conservation dog team. And um, we've got dogs that uh, find ants, um, yeah. played skink, um, rats, um, uh, mustelids, which are your stoats and weasels and things. Plus, you've got the species dogs that are looking for kiwi, takahi, kakapo, all that sort of stuff. So there's, there's, the use of dogs in New Zealand is, is uh, quite extensive. There is, uh, I have another dog that's been sent to a lady in Whangarei, and she's been working on a plant called alligator weed. And also the dog is becoming very successful on a plant called batwing passion vine that grows in the native bush up there. There's a plant, another dog, plant dog in the Waikato that is doing uh, alligator weed, which is another farm yeah. uh, pasture type weed. And uh, there is another dog supposedly training in the North Island on Nagora burr, which is another pasture type weed. So this and when you when you do a search on the internet, there is a lot of plants now that I've a lot of dogs worldwide that are doing plant detection. Doing plant detection, yeah, 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 yeah it's I, great. I started, yeah. yeah, I started doing it and knew nothing about it, but I've found out about this later on when I've done more right. research. Yeah, it's pretty amazing that you you stumbled across that, and then sort of not not doing retirement and coming back into work was that because you just sort of to it in your thumbs decided you want to do stuff what was what drove that decision? yeah i just i just get bored yeah i've got a bit of a yeah. thing i like um i i used to do a lot of hunting and i i gave the hunting away and um, i've gone back and straight back into this pest control which gives me excuse to buy firearms and things like that so i i had i got rid of all my firearms but i've sort of basically gone and um gone down the track of getting firearms that are used more for pest control work. I don't do any deer stalking or anything now. That's just hard work. Uh, yeah. It's just more rabbit control. And, right. And, and do you use uh, the dogs, dogs, uh, dogs for that as well? No, I don't use the dogs. No, no, I just no, do that. No. It's all on my own. Yeah. 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 And, and how do you, awesome. you know, how do people get to hear about you? So with the, the weed detection business and then obviously your sort of tracking you're doing now, how do, how do you get to know, how do people get to know you? Well, the, the weed detection work, I'm known throughout New Zealand with all councils. I've got a really good network, uh, first name yeah. basis with people in every council in New Zealand. So um, I'm well known. Um, I also do work for MPI, 
Ministry of Primary Industries. Um, I do a lot of work with them, so they've I'm, I'm sort of on their radar. Yeah, we've, we've got other stuff that I can't talk about that we're looking at doing uh, with MPI. So that's just sort of under the radar at the moment. And um, it's just basically word of mouth. I haven't done any advertising because I don't need any more work. I've, I've I say it sounds like you have plenty. Now. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and I guess it, 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 initially you were probably the only person doing it. So I, I presume that work just came yes. to you once once it got out there that there was this, you know, this skill set and the dog that could actually find find this stuff. So that's uh, not, not that surprising. And then the pest control, did that come from the same sort of network? Um, I approached the local council. Um, I had another another one of these light bulb moments many years ago, which, uh, and this gets a wee bit a wee bit tricky, a bit of a sensitive subject, um, poisoning rabbits. And um, yeah. there's uh, also a university in Australia were testing using carbon monoxide produced from an engine. Um, and gassing down the burrows with exhaust fumes. And I've done a wee bit of research on that. And um, the, the, the methods they use now, like magtox and, and cyanide stuff, it's really dangerous chemicals to deal with. And it's mm -hmm. a really nasty chemical on the animals. It's not humane. Carbon yeah. monoxide is very humane. Um, you just, the animals just go to sleep. And uh, I talked to a vet about it. And um, the vet confirmed to me that um, the most humane way is uh, exhaust gas is very, very simple, very painless and not cruel. So I've built a little uh, two stroke motor, a couple of meters of heat proof hose on it. And I just insert that down the burrow, fill it up with dirt, start the motor, leave it for 20 minutes, uh, job done. And is the that local what's council the... had a... Sorry, go on. Uh, the local council had a massive problem with rabbits in the local cemetery, like hundreds and hundreds of rabbits. Invercargill Cemetery was known for its rabbit population. So I approached the council and they said, well, we've, we've tried everything else and nothing's worked. So um, you're welcome to try. And we negotiated an hourly rate and I set to uh, with a map and a marker pen and started at one corner of the cemetery and worked my way through the cemetery, which took me about a month and a half, um, gassing all under the headstones and all the burrows and filling in all the dirt and everything. And then it got to the stage where we were down to the big macrocarpa hedges and I couldn't get under the hedges to get the hose down the burrow. And I said to them, the only way now to finish this off is to actually shoot the cemetery at night. And I use a, a what's called a PCP air rifle, which is a very, very, very accurate, very quiet, very powerful air rifle. And we did health and safety stuff and signage and all that. And I went into the cemetery at night and night shooting. So we're down to the stage now where I have got the rabbits in that cemetery are numbered. I'm down to three rabbits. Um, my records, uh, I took me over 500 rabbits out of the cemetery with the rifle. And, and I don't know how many I took with the gassing. So, and with, so. anyone listening that maybe is wondering why, why you need to kill all these rabbits, what's the, uh, what's the main sort of issue that, that you get from rabbits for people that maybe aren't used to living on farms or um, experiencing this stuff? Well, it's not it's farms. It's I think um, I forget the records, but I think four or five rabbits can eat as much grass as one sheep in a night. So they they rob the pasture, they piddle on the pasture, they contaminate it. The sheep don't like eating it, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, um, dig the ground up, just just and and very very short time go into plague proportions. The problem with the cemetery was they were undermining all the headstones and all the headstones were falling right, out. Right, right, right. We, and we have a lot of um, a lot of people walking around the cemetery and we've had a lot of people where the ground has collapsed and they've actually had falls in the cemetery because of the rabbit burrows. Because of the rabbit burrows, Plus, okay, yeah. Yeah, it's just an unsightly mess. They just destroy everything. They, they, yeah. And in the winter, they, they, there's a lot of rose garden plantings around the cemetery they actually dig the rose bushes up and they eat the, the roots off the roses 
um, there's nothing growing above ground, so they dig underground and they actually destroy the rose bushes by eating the root system. Then they do their uh, plantings, their, their ornamental plantings. They did one planting one night, $1,500 worth of plants, come back in the morning and the whole lot were gone. Yeah. The rabbits ate the lot in one night. So um, all the shrubbery was getting eaten. It was just, yeah, just very, very messy. Rabbit droppings yeah. everywhere. Um, yeah. So not a, not a nice nice thing to go when that population is allowed to get to that stage so yeah we're, we're yeah. just in a maintenance role now it's yeah you know, keep it under control keep it under control and what what does a typical day look like for you if there is such a thing um i usually um yeah if i start my day i usually start at about 10 30 11 o'clock in the morning when i get out of bed um walk the dogs do a bit of plant training um, I've got uh, some possum traps in different areas where I trap possums specifically that the council want rid of possums in an area. So I, yeah. those traps have got to be checked. They're, they're cage traps. So they've got to be checked each day. And um, I do that. And um, then uh, I'm the chief cook and bottle washer, a bit of housework and um, cook the evening meal. And then just on dark, usually about 8.30, 9 o'clock, I'm away out into the field with one of my rifles and I'm usually not home till half three, four o'clock in the morning. So oh, wow. so you do work, a long, yeah. Yeah, my possum, uh, my possum work and a lot of rabbit work is night shooting. So um, all the modern gear I've got, um, thermal, thermal imaging handheld scope so I can see the animals and the rifles, all my rifles have got infrared scopes on them. So I'm not using spotlights or anything. I'm just a secret squirrel in the dark and everything I've got's night vision. So yeah. It's the modern way of getting these animals. It's um it's very quiet. The rifle's extremely quiet, makes no noise at all. So it's um and it's very safe because the thermal imaging, I can I can spot a human at a kilometer with the heat signature. So it makes it very safe. I can yeah. I can see probably safer shooting at night than it is um, in the daylight because of the thermal imaging. I can see exactly what's around me and I can identify yeah. what the animal is very, very easily with the infrared. It's, um, you know, and it's only shoot at, um, at confirmed animals, not at movement and all that sort of stuff. Just Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I guess, and the possums, similarly with rabbits, you know, the possums are in New Zealand, the threat is more to the native bird population and other things like that has been the issue when they when they were sort of brought into the country. We've got a, a park in the middle of Invercargill City that's 200 acres uh, called Queen's Park, which has got absolutely fabulous growth areas. The, the, the trees are really valuable and ornamental trees, and that was being decimated so in the last three weeks, I've taken 80 possums out of that 200 acres of land. They didn't realize how many possums they had in there. Actually, in I've there, still yeah. got more to go. I've still got another half a dozen in there yet. So it was quite amazing. And you could see the damage to the trees. It's the same. The possums get down on the rose bushes when they, they love rose buds. And when they're rose bushes, which are prized yeah. ornamental roses they come into bud the possums just absolutely decimate them they destroy right. a rose bush in it yeah and, yeah yeah, um, yeah all the other ornamental trees they just eat everything yeah plus i would expect this year we're going to have a massive bird breeding season because possums also eat eggs and the young of other nesting birds up in the tree so the fact that i've taken all those possums out of there um, and hand in hand with the possums i've also taken out probably in excess of 30 rabbits out of that park as well so yeah, yeah and that has, that, so, be, that has a big impact because um that's always one of the sort of things about you know many many years ago all, you, all you'd hear outside of new zealand was was bird song it was so so loud um and obviously over the years with possum and other sort of thing uh, animals that have been introduced have you know reduced that native bird population so it sounds like this type of stuff can help build that back up um for what you're describing certainly pre a, a sort of breeding season Yes, that's what I'm hoping for. And um, yeah. of course, we're hoping for predator-free New Zealand by 2050, which I won't see, but I want to try and do my part to get that way. And I'm No, you never, you, never, you never know. You never know. It's only <laughs> is it 20, 29 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Will I aim 70? Well, yeah, people yeah. live to 100. <laughs> you can be yeah, optimistic. Hopefully. You're spending all this yeah, time outdoors. Yeah. It'd be very good for you. Um, yeah. And yeah. you sort of, you know, this you're, you're quite different to trade businesses that we speak to uh, usually. But do, would you have any advice? I mean, you've, it's interesting that you've sort of set up businesses um, based on a very defined skill set. And any advice for people that are looking to get into the trades, maybe not necessarily to do canine detection or pest control? Well, I, I, I went into the trade uh, trade on my dad's advice. Uh, well, my dad's, he had three lots of advice. Was One, one was don't get married. Um, two was join the Navy and go to sea or get a trade. So I ended up, um, I left school when I was 15 and went straight in an apprenticeship as a motor mechanic. And that's yeah. been my grounding. That's, that's taken me everywhere. Um, the fact that I had that qualification, going back, I won't go into all the details, but I've had a long history of working at sea, working on oil rigs and stuff like that. And the motor mechanic trade, that mechanical trade got me into all that sort of work. So, right. um, you know, if you're not an absolutely brilliant academic, um, although trades now it has become much, much more academic. Uh, in my days... Um, if you had school certificate, you got uh, a bonus of getting, I think you got your first, you could sit your paper A and paper B in the first year if you had school certificate. If right. you didn't have school certificate, you could only sit paper A in the first year and paper B in the second year. So your first qualifying took you two years. If you had school cert, it only took you one year. They abandoned that sort of carry on and... Um, the apprenticeship usually started off at five years and then with a lot of changes i was fully certified motor mechanic after three three and a half years but the trade is is i, I advise anyone to go into the, into a trade get a trade behind you and you've always got something to fall back on yeah i've always i've never ever been without work and then right. later on the the trade qualification got me into the into the smelter new zealand aluminium smelters when i was in my mid 20s and um i did all my fitter welder training at the smelter yeah so the that initial trade got me in there for a start off yeah 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 no, cool yeah no it's good advice yeah. I and mean, it's definitely a, a move towards that because you're right it seems that um especially right now there's a massive shortage of high quality trades people and so um it's definitely a good skill set yeah. to have now we john we always finish yeah. on a handful of questions uh which i've been intrigued by your your answers one is if um if you were going to pick another trade I and mean, you've done you've done quite a lot already so i don't know what this would be, if you weren't doing pest control and um canine weed detection what would you be doing uh i would i honestly would stay with the electrical trade there's so much as you know people say oh, i am an electrician but there's so much in the electrical trade and the part that i really enjoyed was working with the Southern Cross Hospital Group, and my main work was uh, looking after cardiac and body protected areas, right. which I yeah. the operating theatres and all that sort of stuff. So I used to do all the all the cardiac and body protected testing, which has got to be done every year. And yeah, um, yeah I really enjoyed that sort of work. Yeah, that was the part yeah. that I really enjoyed. Yeah, so well, that was we... the last ten years of my work was doing that work. Yeah, and it's uh, it's an area that will keep just keep growing, right? And electric vehicles and everything else that's happening It'll in that in that space. It, yeah, um, yeah, it's just it's not going to slow down. Yeah, it's good advice. And then and um, the LED LED lighting was another one. I did a lot of LED lighting work, converting and power saving and all that sort of stuff, converting yeah. all the different areas to LED lighting. So that's that's another big area, huge yeah. area. Yeah, power yeah, saving. yeah, agreed. Um, the other one is, you know, what, what's your general go-to kind of on-site when you're tra traveling around with the dog or you're on-site trying to catch rabbits? What's your favorite lunch? Uh, peri-peri tuna in a pouch. Oh, peri-peri tuna. Oh, okay. So that's already ready-made. In made. a pouch. In a pouch. Yes, in a pouch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yes, yep. I know what you mean. You carry that all. Yeah. My dog absolutely loves it, and I love it. So dog likes, the dog likes the peri peri. Oh, the dog, the dog loves peri peri tuna. Yeah, that's right. my go to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. And one square, yeah. one square meal bars. Yeah, easy to carry and a lot of energy. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. 
Cool. And then yeah. um, you're in Invercargill. Things have started to sort of um, open up somewhat. Just a time stamp. This is New Zealand's been in a lockdown. You're coming out of that lockdown. If you had a choice of a, an event you could go to, sporting event or music event, um, what would it be? I sport doesn't worry me, and I'm not into loud music events. It means I, I don't I don't go to events events like that. Um, no, unfortunately, I don't have anything like that that I'm really keen on. A, a quiet meal out is my go-to. Um, not into crowded places. Not, yeah. not into that sort of stuff. Yeah, I wouldn't cross the road to go to a sporting event, unfortunately. Okay, all right. Well, that's, uh, that's easy. I do go to the odd car show. The car shows, if there's any car shows around, I do that yeah. because my son's into classic cars and he usually enters one or two of his um, yeah. done-up cars. So... Yeah, that's that's my main event would be classic car shows. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And we're, then last, we're the center of we're the center of New Zealand for classic cars with the with the um, uh, what do they call it the um, motorbike motorbike mecca down here and the uh, Richardson Group with their car collection probably the biggest yeah. car collection in the southern hemisphere. So. Oh really? I didn't yeah. know that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. And then last question is anyone you would recommend that we should speak to other interesting people that you come across in the trades you think would make a good conversation? Um, no, there's I've only other got there's only other dog people. Um, there is, uh, but they're not people using Tradify at this stage. I'm trying to talk one person into using Tradify. It would save her a lot of work. Um, uh, you don't have to use Tradeify to be on the podcast, but we do appreciate it. Yeah, there's um, um, the only other person that would be really, really interesting is Miriam Ritchie, which uh, Miriam lives in Whangarei, and Miriam has just come back from um, oh, Howl, Lord Howell Island. She's been doing rat detection on Lord Howell Island. And she also did uh, rat detection in the Falklands and in the Shetland Islands. Miriam goes all over the world with her dogs doing rat detection. So oh, wow. Miriam would be, yeah, yeah. That's in okay. the doggy yeah. world. In the dog world, yeah, yeah. great. Well, look, this has been this has been fascinating. It's been really interesting to hear you talk through the, the sort of journey and and what you're doing, certainly with the dogs and even on the on the pest control. I learned some stuff today which I wasn't wasn't aware of. Um, so that's been uh, really interesting and I really appreciate, John, you spending the time and good luck with the continued uh, use of dogs, finding those weeds. I think it's really good work and saves lots of pastures and other things in, in New Zealand, which is which is important to protect the environment. So appreciate it um, and thanks for joining us. And um, as always, for everyone else, if you've enjoyed this, please do rate, review and do all that usual good stuff and give us feedback. Um, it's appreciated. John, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks very much. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of this episode. Behind the Tools is brought to you by Tradeify, job management software for your trade business. If you enjoyed the podcast, let us know by leaving a review and be sure to tell your mates about it. Email behindthetools at tradeifyhq.com if you or someone you know would be keen to join the show as a guest.